Mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As I mentioned before in the, in the welcome announcements, this year is the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation. To be specific, it's the 500th anniversary of when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the All Saints Church, also called the Castle Church there in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, those 95 Theses, I mean, they're, it's just a scrap of paper. But wow, what that scrap of paper started, a movement that that scrap of paper started, put on its way. It's amazing. I got to tell you, you might sound like an exaggeration, but it is not an exaggeration to say that God, through Martin Luther and the Reformation, changed the course of human history from that point on. For months now, I've been thinking, okay, what would be the best way to observe the 500th? What should we do? I mean, how do we mark this in time, right? On the one hand, I mean, it's a big deal. It is, and we should celebrate this legacy that we've received. But on the other hand, I ask myself, but how would Martin Luther really want us to observe it? I mean, really, what would Martin say? And I, from what I read of his writings, I think Martin Luther would say, I don't like the hubbub. Just focus on Jesus Christ. Preach Jesus. Read his word. Just focus on that. Be all that. In fact, did you know that he did not even want his followers calling themselves Lutheran? Would you read this with me? I ask that my name be left silent and people not call themselves Lutheran, but rather Christians. Who's Luther? The doctrine's not mine. Let us be called Christians. So you're probably thinking, then why do we? It's kind of like one of those things. He realized that after a while that horse had left the barn, so to speak, and there was a group of people. Actually, you know, it was um, a guy named Eck. What a last name, right? Eck. Eck was his, um, his opponent of Luther. And Eck, in derision, in derogatory, called, oh, those, those Lutherans. And the names stuck for 500 years now. But Luther was like, no, it's not about me. It's about Christ. So call yourself Christians. So yeah, we will celebrate a little bit for this 500th anniversary. We'll have that German dinner at the end of the month. We will serve in the name of Jesus, which I think is a great, appropriate way to observe something like this. We'll serve on October 31st, Halloween, with our hot dog outreach. And actually, the 31st is actually the Reformation Day. But most of all, and I think what Luther would like, we're going to, how we're going to observe the 500th is by worshiping Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to live and to suffer and to die and to rise, to reconcile the world back to God. That's what it's all about. By God's grace, through faith alone, you are saved from your sins. You are saved from the power of the devil. You are saved from an eternal death in hell. And ultimately, that's what the 500th anniversary is about. Jesus saving you. So these next few weeks, this series, I want us to be transported back in time. I want us to be able to watch Luther as he finds the real God, the God of love and the God of mercy. Yeah, he's a just God, no question about it, but he's ultimately a God of love and mercy that Luther didn't understand him to be. I want us, I want the 1500s to come alive for us. And you're thinking, why? That's 500 years ago. And not just to understand history, but to come alive for us, because I gotta tell you, the problem the church was facing 500 years ago in many ways, it's still the problem the church is facing today. It's still relevant today. And the solution for, 15, for 500 years ago, for the 1500s, is still the solution for the church, for the world today. So I want the 1500s to come alive. And I could, I could do my best to try to explain it and use pictures up here and talk about history and stuff, but I found a tool that I think will work far better than me trying to do that. So these next, I'd like for you to watch this 13-minute video, 13-minute video. And as you do, I ask you to pay attention closely to see the fear. See the fear that Christians had about their sins and their fear of death.
In nearly 500 years ago, an unknown monk from a backwater town in Germany, he set in motion a movement that would literally transform Western civilization. His name was Martin Luther. You know, I love what he said. He said, I never thought such a storm would rise out of Rome over a simple scrap of paper, but it did. Because he set free the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that had been held captive for nearly 1,200 years by a church and by a book. Five hundred years ago, the people of Europe were under the domination of a, a very powerful religious empire. The Roman Catholic Church of the 16th century, an empire that controlled every aspect of a person's life. Uh, it could raise you to glory or condemn you as a heretic and burn you alive. So the church at that time had evolved or grown into this institution which was quite intimidating for the average person. The entire mass was done in Latin and the people didn't really know what was going on. They had memorized parts of it without really understanding what the parts meant. They just knew this was big, important, special stuff. But actually understanding what was being said, not really. Books were still rare. You could have an entire church that might not have an actual Bible in it. You would have maybe outtakes or little parts of it, but a full Bible was, was not common. Death is something people encounter all the time. To get through infancy was a significant accomplishment. People spend a lot more time thinking about what's next, and it was not a happy thought for most people. Martin Luther was the son of Hans and Margareta Luther. He was born November 10th, 1483. He was baptized the very next day. The children were baptized as soon as possible after birth because you just didn't know if a child was going to live. Infant mortality rates were huge in those days. And he ends up being named Martin Luther because he's baptized on St. Martin's Day. Uh, Hans had been a minor. Uh, he became an entrepreneur when Luther was very young. So Hans had dreams of not only moving from the agricultural peasantry into the mining industry, he had dreams of moving his son into the bureaucracy, where there was more money, more security, more power. And so he had a, a vision for the Luther family that, that was on the move, upward and onward. There was no such thing as social security in those days. Your social security policy or your insurance policy for your old age, as it were, was your children, specifically your sons. And so Hans had big ambitions for his second son, Martin. He had designs on making him into a lawyer. The Luther family moved from Eisleben to Mansfeld, and Martin Luther went to elementary school here, and primarily it was a Latin school. And later, Luther would record the fact that in one morning he was caned or disciplined somehow 15 times for not having prepared his Latin lesson correctly. You know, people sometimes have these rather um, nostalgic, you know, views of, oh, wouldn't it be have been great to live in the 16th century? Your know, life was hard then. Even the attitudes of society were, were very difficult and, and, and rather harsh. Everything in those days was pretty strict in terms of the upbringing of young people. The church was strict. His parents were very strict. As a matter of fact, Luther later said that his concept of God the Father was somewhat influenced by the fact that his own father was very strict and he wasn't sure how much he loved his father at that point after getting disciplined. For small offenses in the civil realm, there would be rather harsh punishments. And this is part of what Luther grew up with. He, he recollects, as he got older, you know, being punished by his parents sometimes for stealing a nut. And he said the blood flo flowed from the punishment he got. And the same thing he would experience in the schools. Just, it was, it was a harsh sort of world. The image they had of Christ was the image from the, from the apocalypse of St. John. Christ in, in glory, and Christ in judgment. And coming from his mouth would be the lily on the one hand, and the, the sword on the other hand. And the lily of God's mercy and God's forgiveness, but the sword of wrath and judgment. So the burning question was, how do I avoid the sword and get the lily? Well, the church had the answer for this. And the answer, interestingly enough, came down to something you could put in the form of a slogan. 
which was actually preached from pulpits. Do what is in you. Do what is in you and God will not refuse you grace. At least do the best you can. So God gives his grace and I use that grace and I accomplish what God wants me to do. But what happens if I mess up? Well, there's an answer for that too. I go to church and at church I would meet the priest one on one and I would confess to him. And that would open the rite of penance, which would be I confess and then he gives me some kind of satisfaction to perform, something that needs to be done to show that I have a truly penitent heart. It might be a Hail Mary, it might be a more rigorous kind of action, or it might be a suggestion that I could give a donation to a certain cause. And if I would go and do penance, then I could be assured I was forgiven for that particular sin. So it was very, very carefully worked out system. This amount of sin, this amount of penance, everything's right again, you're back on track, and away you go. Now, what if I don't do enough penance? What if I don't quite cover all the sin? The answer is some time in purgatory. And so you die, you're not quite good enough for God yet, but you're on the right track. They're not gonna send you to hell, that wouldn't be right. But you can go to purgatory, and in purgatory, we'll get you cleaned up, or God will get you cleaned up. So purgatory is not pleasant. You're, you're suffering in purgatory, purgatory. You're sweating off your sins. And so I finished paying for all of my sinful behavior, and when I finally had paid every last bit in purgatory, then, then I'm ready now for the next step, and now I can walk into God's presence. But it was a very careful system. And all the way along, it's God's grace that's making this happen, and it's you that's doing it. You're the one earning the forgiveness. You're the one paying the price. You're the one accomplishing it. So the, the onus is on you to make sure it gets done. Now, this was the religion that Luther grew up with, and after he completed what we would call high school, he was recommended for the University of Erfurt. Luther received his bachelor's degree after about a year of study at the University of Erfurt. And then after about another two and a half, almost three years, he gets his master's degree. And now the master's degree was kind of a general purpose degree. It wasn't in a particular subject yet. But it enabled somebody who wanted to go on in higher education to move on to one of the higher faculties, which were only three in those days, medicine, law, or theology. But something that's going on in Luther's life while he's studying at the University of Erfurt, he noticed a great bound copy of an old book in the library, and it turned out to be the Holy Bible in the Vulgate Latin translation. Uh, he had heard readings from the Bible before, but never realized they all even came from the same book, because in those days, the Bible was regarded as a very dark and obscure document, which only the clergy could properly interpret. Now remember, Luther's born right at the advent of the printing press's discovery, but it was still in its infancy, and b books were still rare. If you had a book, it meant somebody had to hand copy that book. And so Bibles, they're very expensive because you had to copy every single line of every single Bible by hand. But in Luther's time growing up, there were, there were Bibles that were very rarely found. Luther was very much aware, as were all Christians at the time that the church said, now you need our help in order to be able to understand this. You need guidance, expert guidance to interpret this very mysterious book. But there were other events in Luther's life that focused his attention on the hereafter. In 1503, he was paying a visit to his parents, leaving Erfurt and going back to where they were, and he sustained a, an injury from a sword that pierced an artery going into his leg. Uh, and bled profusely, uh, which uh, was a very frightening occurrence for him. Uh, it reinforced a fear of death. Uh, I say reinforced because fear of death was very, very widespread at that time. You have to remember that death could come very suddenly. You could get sick in the morning and be dead by evening from some sort of bug. Uh, plagues regularly went through cities. Uh, women died in childbirth. Uh, death was much more a part of the daily consciousness in that time than it is now. And so when Luther accidentally stabbed himself, it was simply reinforcing a fear of death that was already there. Luther did recover. But there were other occasions in which uh, a friend of his named Alexis, for example, died. And Luther again wondered, what if I were Alexis? Uh, two of his colleagues in Erfurt died of the plague at the time. And so here this young student was looking way ahead into the future and the life to come, 
early on in life. On July 2nd, 1505, Luther's coming back from visiting his parents, back on his way to Erfurt. He's only been in law school for, oh, about six weeks or so. Not very long by the time he took his leave of absence. And there's a thunderstorm that comes up. He is frightened for his life standing out there and the lightning and the thunder. He cries out, Saint Anne, help me, I will become a monk. And as somebody once said, well, she did. And he did. And it was goodbye to law school. About two weeks after that great experience at the thunderstorm, Luther basically dispossesses himself of all of his possessions, including a very expensive law book that his dad had gotten him as a graduation present for his master's degree graduation, and goes into the toughest monastery he can find there in Erfurt, that of the observant Augustinians. <laughs> entered an Augustinian monastery uh, and uh, did indeed uh, take a vow, which he later admitted was uh, made under duress and uh, was not sincere, but it was a vow that he took and he felt he needed to complete. In the late medieval people were very concerned with their destination after death, and Martin Luther shared that concern. And so his decision to enter a monastery was motivated, at least in part, by this concern for what would happen to him after he died. And he believed, as was common at that time, and as the church encouraged, that going to a monastery, becoming a monk, would give him a better chance, a better chance of a happy result after he died. You know, obsessed by guilt and the fear of damnation, Luther was trying in vain to find assurance of his salvation. I love what he said. He said, I was a pious monk. You know, if ever there was a monk that got into heaven over monkery, I would have gotten there. So as Luther was entering into manhood, he was, he was literally running away from the world, um, hiding in the monasteries, trying to find peace with God. But the book, the book that he found in the University of Erfurt, at first it would torment him, but later it would bring him to the realization that would change the world. Once he got into Rome and he was doing the various things that a religious pilgrim would do in Rome, he got less and less enchanted with the city of Rome. In fact, later on he said, boy, if, if there's a hell, Rome is built on it. What a sad way to live, right? Here these are Christians, Christians at the time. They were worried, they were in fear of death, they were in fear of their sins, they were in fear of God and being punished by God. I can't imagine what type of life that was. Afraid, afraid of all those things. Had they only known. Had they only known that they did not have to make satisfaction for their sins. That Jesus Christ had already done that for them. Had they only known that they did not have to do penance or to suffer time in purgatory. They had no rest for their souls. Had they only known that what Luther realized from God's word, that Jesus says this to them and to us. Please read this with me out loud. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray. Lord God, there's still many among us, and sometimes the devil even whispers in our ears that there's no rest in Jesus, that the only rest is when we have rest in our own good works, or that we're better than other people, and the devil tries to do this, Lord. He tries to tempt us to think that we've got to add something to what you, Jesus, have done for us. Forgive us, forgive us for those times, Lord, when we fall to them, those temptations, or even give it a minute of thought that, yeah, maybe I got to do something to add to Jesus' work on the cross. Lord, help us to always, the rest of our lives, rest purely in Jesus, in his life, in his death, and his resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins 
and for our new life that we have in him. This we pray in his name. Amen.